the ignoble. It was in the depths of winter some twenty years ago. We were sitting up late, a party of four, round an immense fire, at the country house of my brother-in-law in the Dordogne. The new arrival of that morning was the then Minister of Justice, Monsieur Henri de Blanc, a cousin of our host, and a pleasant man of undoubted ability, whose independent action in the notorious Vignal case has been deservedly praised. I had never met him before. Indeed, it was the first time that he had visited the district. A prodigious wolf hunt was already organized for the next day, weather permitting, in honor of his coming. The conversation had turned upon the recent catastrophe of the Tay Bridge in Scotland, a lamentable disaster that will be fresh, no doubt, in the memory of everyone. Truly horrible, said our host. It is difficult to conceive any form of death more harrowing. The minister remarked, I can conceive more distressful accidents. Doubly horrible, added our other guest, a neighbor and a retired army surgeon, occurring as it did in the pitch-black night, in that howling tempest. On the contrary, monsieur, I venture to think that we must regard that as an alleviating circumstance. Our host said, I believe you are right, Henri. I was once eyewitness of an accident that seemed to me far more horrible on that very account. I happened to be walking, one cloudless afternoon, along the path that runs at the edge of the Rheinfall of Schafthausen. Imagine my surprise on seeing, not far away, a boat containing some dozen ladies and gentlemen, visitors at my hotel, and with whom I had already exchanged a few words of civility. I called to warn them of the evident danger, but although they must surely have heard me, they seemed to be entirely occupied with their rowing. Then the truth dawned upon me. They were already caught in the terrific current, and the men strained every nerve to row upstream again. But it was too late. Ah, oh, my dear Henri, what a sickening spectacle! Those two or three minutes were prolonged to an eternity. As the boat approached the fatal edge it was drawn forwards with inconceivable rapidity. Then the men suddenly dropped their oars, and a scream came from the boat, a scream such as I hope never to hear again. It leapt like lightning over the edge, and I saw nothing but a confused mass of brightly colored dresses mingling with the rainbows and mists that rose up to meet them from the steaming abyss. Not a particle of them was ever found. They must have been literally torn to shreds. A horrible death. When one thinks of those happy young people, within a stone's throw of land, the glorious sun shining overhead? Horrible, yes replied the minister. Your illustration is, from the point of view of the horrible, doubtless an improvement in various ways upon the Scotch catastrophe. But there are yet worse deaths. There are ignoble deaths. Let me explain myself. I use that word as opposed to noble. Ignoble deaths are always horrible, and sometimes more. This was a horrible death, but it was not an ignoble one. A fine distinction, said the doctor. Besides, he added, it was merciful, inasmuch as it was sudden. These poisonings by prussic acid, these fallings into vat of melted sugar or into agricultural machines are all quick deaths. What are two or three minutes? On the other hand, a lingering fatal disease is too long. The sufferer enjoys a respite, an interval of forgetfulness, of hope. No patient so hopeful as those who suffer from hopeless diseases. Therefore, an agony must be protracted to a proper length of time. It must be neither too short nor too long. You are an ogre, I said. A harmless blagueur, added my brother-in-law, like all military men. I agree with you, monsieur, said the minister. A particle of hope... A momentary release of pain destroys the artistic effect. The artistic effect! We all laughed. It was characteristic of him to throw his whole soul into a subject. I observed, Your Excellency is not easily satisfied. Let me suggest, as the ne plus ultra of ignoble deaths, the possibility of being buried alive. 
in this instance you will admit we pass a sufficiently disagreeable quarter of an hour an uninterrupted agony of body and mind a sensation of utter hopelessness well yes perhaps mused the minister but i think the agony might under certain circumstances be protracted yet further and it is such an extremely important element that duration of time in a coffin the air would soon be exhausted i fear we all laughed again he dilated con amore upon the gruesome subject and then sir while we are treating of this question i think that a premature burial is not for another reason entirely satisfactory it does not exhaust the full capabilities of suffering why for the simple reason that there is something worse than this sheer hopelessness of which you speak yes there is something infinitely worse i conceive that there must be cases on record in which the victim while realizing the hopelessness of his position is tormented in addition by the knowledge that friends are close at hand eager to help if they but knew of his plight would you not regard that as an aggravation an aesthetic refinement certainly that point of view has never struck me before and i think i could cite a case in illustration i lately read of a shoemaker one of a large party who accidentally slipped into the crater of mount vesuvius and was suspended head downwards and at a great depth by his coat which had miraculously caught on a projecting rock he hung over the awful cauldron not daring to move or even to call out for fear of shaking himself free besides dreading every minute to lose consciousness in the sulphur fumes and drop down his friends on the height shouted down to him utterly powerless to help but he dared not answer at last they went away perhaps they thought him dead imagine his feelings and yet he objected i fear he may have been buoyed up by some shadow of hope however faint and that would impair the perfect harmony he was saved in the end after hanging there for four days he was saved he said it in a tone of bitter disappointment that ruins the situation besides an agony of four days surely that is too long i consider twelve hours a substantial measure you reason like a philosopher the doctor added with enthusiasm his excellency speaks like a true artist and connoisseur the doctor resumed the subject permit me to submit to your excellency's consideration the following example which i trust may meet with your approval some fifteen years ago i was called at st etienne to view unprofessionally the remains of a stoker who had met with a singular fate it seems that the poor wretch had climbed presumably for the sake of coolness uh, it was in the heat of summer into some part of an immense unfinished furnace he fell asleep there and during this interval the entrance was bricked up and the fire lighted it was only next day that his absence was remarked and the furnace opened an expensive piece of work at the suggestion of one of his fellow workers who remembered having seen the unhappy man creep in the men all agreed in stating that they had heard unnatural roarings in the furnace that died away as the fire grew hotter i congratulate you my friend i said that last stroke especially was masterful you have brought us a good step forward monsieur said the minister and i am particularly thankful to you for this illustration as it supports my previous contention for this is decidedly a more ignoble form of death than a premature burial in so far as it is even less natural and less decorous and in addition i cannot but think that the agony was prolonged to more than that bad quarter of an hour of which we spoke only imagine a large roomy furnace as opposed to a narrow coffin and then that delicate embellishment the proximity of friends only a foot of brick and mortar between life and death yes we are narrowing the sphere and yet from an artistic point of view this case leaves much to be desired it suffers in my humble opinion from a most serious defect how so we all asked he replied the ignoble becomes intensified in proportion as it afflicts those who are not ignoble what is a shoemaker a stoker 
ignoble personages. The quality must be brought into sharper relief. To the bodily suffering there must be superadded a mental and moral agony such as we cannot suppose ignoble persons to appreciate. For, let us freely confess, there are like men of another nation in this, that their sufferings do not appeal to us. The impalement of ten thousand Chinamen leaves me cool, interrupted the doctor. Very true, monsieur, but I was referring exclusively to accidental deaths, for to the ignoble ones devised by man against man there is, I fear, no conceivable limit. And I was saying that the sufferings of vulgar people are rarely interesting. Only indifferent authors treat of the emotions of the lower classes, and no man of taste reads them. The great dramatists know why they selected exalted personages to suffer a tragic or noble fate, and the German Schopenhauer, I think it is he, has correctly explained the matter when he says that they fall from a greater height than the common herd. The same applies to ignoble fates. Tragic deaths move our tears, ignoble ones our disgust, and I conceive that the extreme of either is reserved for the aristocracy. I said, that the noble and the ignoble should coincide upon one point is a curious fact which I have not seen established elsewhere. They seem to lie at opposite poles. They do, sir, he replied, but they touch in their extremes. And it is precisely in the extreme of the ignoble, in this particular department, which I am seeking to attain. That point beyond which there is nothing more ignoble. And therefore I say, for the ignoblest deaths, the subject must be of noblest race and noblest mind. He cannot be too carefully chosen. I mark and appreciate your Excellency's qualification, said the doctor. I would suggest further, as regards the age of the subject, that he should be young. That seems appropriate. There is doubtless something more outrageous, something more revolting to our sense of fitness and beauty in the death of a young person than in that of one who has already taken his fill of years. Yet I venture to disagree with you. To my way of thinking, youth is invariably deficient in dignity and repose, two qualities, perhaps only extrinsic ones, that figure in our conception of what is truly noble. The full-blooded generosity of youth may shine in tragical situations, but it does not offer such an antithesis to the ignoble as the calm and almost sacred dignity of age, the violation of which is ignoble in a particular degree. No, I am disposed to think that the subject should be well stricken in the years. Let me add another restriction, I said. The sufferer should be a woman. There is a pathos in the helplessness and the refinement of the sex. By all means, sir, it should be a woman. We are approaching the climax, for it now only remains to decide upon the agency of her death and the manner. It should, above all things, be as unnatural, as degrading as possible, for the essence of the ignoble is that which debases the dignity of man, even as the tragic exalts it. Our host is thoughtful. Well, Edmund, you are about to make a suggestion, I perceive? Strangely enough, he said, I could relate from my own experience a case that fulfills, I think, every one of the various conditions that you have deduced. In fact, if I may say so, it improves upon your ideal. I would call it the dernier mot. The dernier mot. Ah, it concerns an old lady who lived, when I was still a boy, in a two-roomed cottage on this estate. She was popularly known as the Marquis from the great airs she gave herself, but my mother told me that her correct name was de la Marliniere. She was of noble blood, but poor, poor as a rat, and a chronic sufferer from rheumatism. She lived alone with a large family of cats, in whose company she seemed to take the greatest pleasure, perhaps because they were the only remaining friends who would deign to share her lot and not make her poverty a subject of reproach. Latterly, I understand, the Sisters of Charity lent her a half-witted little girl to attend on her during the long attacks of illness that nailed her to her couch. As to her character, everyone was agreed that she was gracious, amiable, 
and spirituel, and that she bore her bitter fate with composure. My mother took sincere pleasure in her company. She made pitiable efforts to disguise her poverty. Nothing, I can imagine, can be more distressing than poverty to a refined female mind. Nothing more calculated to undermine the sense of dignity. Very true, we agreed. I have no doubt that, while my sainted mother yet lived, she was in fairly good circumstances, for her pride never disdained to accept help from a friend of her own sex and whom she considered as of her own standing. I well remember those periodical visits to the cottage and the impression of destitution they made upon me as a boy. Everything seemed small and mean, doubly so when I heard her discoursing in an affected language and of matters I did not understand. To revenge myself, I used to tease her cats. They sat about the room, sleek and mysterious, occupied with their own thoughts. She used to starve herself in order to feed them, and gave to each of them the name of some royal personage. That struck me, I remember, as peculiarly laughable. Such cases are not rare, observed the doctor. Common enough, I dare say. My mother told me never to laugh at her, but to respect her age and poverty. Sometimes she added that she was a distant connection of our family, whose pride prevented her from appearing as such. That was presumably said to heighten my reverence, but it only made me laugh yet more. It struck me as a very ludicrous idea, and I am sorry to say that, after my mother's sudden death, the affairs of my poor relation went from bad to worse. She fell into the direst want, such want as we can scarcely believe to exist. She was clothed in rags and suffered terribly from cold. Often she had scarcely a crust of bread for dinner, and, in addition to her poverty, the torments of rheumatism increased, so that she spent many weeks in bed unable to move a joint. I need hardly say that I only discovered all this when it was too late for soon after my bereavement I left for Paris, and thence, as you know, for the East. I wrote from Paris to the Charity Sisters and to several ladies, interesting them on her behalf. But her pride did not simplify matters. She refused to accept aid, even indirectly, from myself. For the rest, these excellent ladies seem to have forgotten my recommendations very quickly. I am told that one of her last fancies was that she professed to be afraid of being robbed and murdered on account of her diamonds. It was sad and yet laughable. When I returned from my voyage, she was already dead and buried. She had been found dead in her bed. The magistrate volunteered to repeat to me what he elicited from the little girl, who was the only witness of her death. It was in this fashion. Now, Josephine, tell me the truth. Truth? Tell me the exact manner of her death. Death? You do not understand that word. Good. She was ill? She lay in bed for two days with pains. She could not move? No, only her fingers a little, like this. Had she something to eat? There was bread beside her bed. Did you see it? Yes, through the window. Had she water? She often called for water. Why did you bring her no water? I was afraid. Afraid of what? Afraid to open the door. Why did you not open the door? I do not know. What frightened you? The cats. They were thirsty. It was a hot day. I was afraid. How many cats? Six and three little ones. And then? There was no more but they sprang about. Why did you not break the window and let them out? She forbade me to touch it. She feared the thieves. And then? They began to eat. Marie Antoinette, the old tailless one, ate first. Then the others jumped up. Only the dolphin, the little white one, did not eat. They ate much? No, not much, that time. And then? They sprang about more than before and made a noise. What did you do? I looked into the window and watched. It was near her head. What did she do? She looked at me and cried out often. 
What did she say? I do not know. She spoke differently. Why did you not open the door? I was afraid. Why did you not fetch help? Help? You do not understand. Good. Uh, why did you not call the sisters? I do not know. Why did you not call them? I do not know. She disliked the sisters because they gave her food and laughed at her. When you watched the cats, what did you say to yourself? I said, It is all as it should be. Ça doit être ainsi. And then? They were wild, and she cried. There was blood. And then? They ate again. That was about the hour of Ave Maria. After that she cried less. What did you do then? I fetched my loaf and went into the kitchen to sleep. And then? I went to sleep on my bench. And then, in the morning? I looked in at the window. I was frightened. And then? I was frightened. I ran into the woods. That, messieurs, is approximately what the obliging magistrate communicated to me. You spoke of the dernier mot, said the doctor. Now let us suppose that, instead of one, there had been two of these poor old ladies, each equally helpless and suffering within sight of the other. The ignoble effect would clearly have been heightened, and so on ad infinitum. Therefore, alas, it is not the dernier mot. Suppose there had been three, or four, or a hundred. Insatiable monster! The minister said, I think, monsieur, that, from the point of view of the ignoble, the effect would not have been heightened. It seems to me that wherever we encounter intelligent spectators, even though they be fellow sufferers, the tragic element intervenes. And where it intervenes, it dominates. For my part, he added in a whisper audible only to myself, I consider that we have exhausted the discussion. He seemed to be suddenly preoccupied, for he stood up from his chair and raised his hand to his brow as though he had remembered something. Yes, I said aloud, I think we have nearly reached the climax. Nearly, echoed the doctor in a somewhat dissatisfied tone. He was apparently still waiting for the dernier mot. Our host summed up the discussion. Evidently, he said, there is in human nature an element that takes pleasure in contemplating, or at least in discoursing upon, the sufferings of our fellow creatures and of animals. It is useless to deny the fact. The tiger ancestry, maybe? Let us go on to the balcony and examine the sky. We rose at his suggestion and stepped out. It was bitterly cold. The thermometer had fallen to many degrees below the freezing point. The air was exhilarating and pure, and we walked up and down for a while in silence. Another spirit had fallen upon us. His Excellency appeared to be absorbed in meditation. At last the doctor remarked to me, In the plenitude of life, how glibly one talks of death! The sights that I have seen, the words that I, unwilling, have heard! I was present, my friend, on the field of Solferino. But the minister took his cousin aside and asked, in a low voice, That lady of whom you spoke, was it by chance a Mademoiselle Hélène de la Marliniere? That, I believe, was her full name. She left Paris in the early thirties? So I understand. My mother told me that she left it on account of her poverty and in order to escape the persecutions of her relations. She hid herself so well that they never discovered her whereabouts, and this little triumph gave her pleasure. They had treated her as little short of a disgrace to themselves. It is infamous. Ah, because she refused to marry a gentleman called Vilbort? I have heard something to that effect. I see you are acquainted with the matter. Perhaps in your official capacity? My God, she was the only sister of my grandfather. We looked out into the night. The park, with its solemn avenues, lay at our feet embedded in snow. Beyond stretched a vast expanse of undulating forest country. The young moon had already gone to rest, but the snow, between the somber patches of shadow, glittered tremulously with the reflected scintillations of a myriad stars. There was a stillness in the atmosphere that promised good sport for the morrow.